This is the second part of lecture 14 and we will start by talking about biomes. Biomes are areas that have distinctive vegetation and the concept was uh, first really described by um, American ecologists. Uh, the one that we will be using was described by an ecologist whose name was Whitaker. And what he did was he set up um, a fairly simplified way of thinking about uh, vegetation types as being a result of two main features. The first, how much precipitation or rain. The second, what sort of temperature regimes that you would find. So if you plot on a graph um, the mean precipitation and the mean annual temperature of a tropical forest, what you'll find is that there is a very discrete area um, in this space that is described as tropical forest. So what we're going to do now is go through the major biomes and describe some of their features. So this is a map showing the distributions of different biomes across the planet. And one of the things that you will immediately notice is that there is um, an effect of latitude. So for example, the tropical forests are found close to the equator and the deserts are found approximately 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. So as we discussed earlier in part one of this lecture, um, there is a strong effect of changes in sun intensity um, as you go either north or south in latitude. So first we have tropical forests. These are distinguished by having the high, very high biological diversity, um, high temperature, so it's very warm most of the year, and very high precipitation. So these are circumstances under which plants grow extremely well. And because the tropical forests have a multi-dimensional feature to them, you can have the canopy, the middle, the understory, it creates many different habitats. And these different habitats can be populated by different species. So there's a very high biological diversity. The next is savanna. Savannas have low rainfall that's very seasonal and high temperatures year round. These are fire driven ecosystems and they are, you can think of it as a transition between a tropical forest and a desert. So when you have watched Discovery Channel videos on um, savannas, you generally see things like zebra, wildebeest, or gnu, um, the large uh, herbivorous mammals. This picture should be very familiar to those of you who live in the Sonoran Desert. Um, because it's a picture of the Sonoran Desert, it's got a saguaro cactus in the foreground. Um, this is a picture of a hot desert. So there are hot deserts and there are cold deserts. Um, cold deserts tend to be on the interiors of continents like the Gobi Desert. But what's the same between all of the deserts is that they have very low precipitation. So for example, in Arizona, um, we're currently in August, we've had approximately two and a half inches of rain so far this year. Compare that with Austin, Texas, which has had over 30 inches of rain so far this year. It's a dramatic difference. The next biome is sometimes called chaparral, but is traditionally called Mediterranean. In this climate, you have hot, dry summers and cool, wet winters. This is also a fire-driven ecosystem. The primary distribution of this biome is found around the Mediterranean. So we're talking about Spain, France, Italy, Greece, Egypt, Tunisia, Morocco. Uh, but it's also found in California, South America, Southern Africa and Australia. These are also the great wine regions of the world. Wine um, comes from grapes and grapes do particularly well in these climates. Uh, because you have a hot, dry summer, 
many of the plants have had to adapt to preventing water loss and so you'll find that you have uh, very thick leaves, waxy coatings, silvering hairs to reflect light, anything to keep the plants cool and to keep the moisture in over the hot dry season. This picture here is of a boreal forest. Um, this is sometimes also called coniferous forest. These you find in northern Canada and across the northern part of Eurasia. In these uh, areas what you have are very very short summers and long bitterly cold winters. The plants cannot afford to drop their leaves um, they wouldn't have enough time to grow leaves in the short summer season and then photosynthesize and then drop their leaves again. So instead they are evergreen um, and in order to have evergreen leaves that can deal with being frozen they have to be thick and tough and spiny. So you have the spruce, the conifers and the pines doing really well in this system. The next uh, picture is showing you an area of Tundra. Tundra is found in the very far north and the very far south. It is actually also found um, even at the equator in areas of very, very high elevation, like at the tops of Mount Kilimanjaro. Tundra has permanently frozen soil, and so when it is warm enough for some water to um, melt, you generally have puddles of water resting above frozen soil. Because the soil is frozen, plants can't put their roots down very far into it and as a result you have no trees. The next biome are the grasslands. The grasslands are probably the most altered by humans because most of our um, grain crops are actually grasses, so wheat, barley, oats and rice. So we've converted a lot of these, um, this biome into uh, agricultural lands. So we're talking about uh, Central North America, we're talking across Eurasia, um, there's some in South America, some in Southern Africa. Uh, these tend to have low precipitation and a, a high temperature but quite a range of temperatures through the year and they're also fire driven ecosystems. This picture is of a deciduous forest in autumn or fall. This is the time of the year where the plants are pulling all of their nutrients and important chemicals out of their leaves to store it in the stem of the plant and they'll let the leaves then drop to the ground. This is a protective mechanism. The plants do that so that they can reserve their chemicals and their energy for the springtime when temperatures are once again suitable for plants to photosynthesize. Deciduous forests tend to have high precipitation and quite a temperature range. There is a large amount of coniferous, sorry, uh, deciduous forest on the eastern seaboard of the United States, most of Europe, part of China, and then there are some areas of Australia, New Zealand, Southern Africa and Southern America that also have deciduous forests. Okay, so the biome concept was originally designed to describe plant vegetation, so that's terrestrial. But what about aquatic systems? Well, we can extend the concept of the biome to aquatic systems. And all aquatic systems, uh, the first thing you'd want to do is to define three zones, the photic zone, aphotic zone, and benthic realm. The photic zone is the depth to which light can penetrate. It's generally about 200 meters in clear water. If the water is turbid or has a lot of sediment in it, um, the light will not be able to penetrate very far at all. The photic zone is the zone in which photosynthesis can occur. Below that, where it is dark, it's called the aphotic zone. And the aphotic zone only gets nutrients from organisms that were living in the photic zone that are either dying or defecating into it. The benthic realm is the uh, bottom surface of whatever water system you're looking at. So in 
an oceanic system, an ocean, an ocean basically is a water system that has got high salinity, whereas fresh water has low salinity or low salt. So within an ocean system, once again, you can uh, define that photic zone up to about 200 meters and then the aphotic zone. Um, you can have the benthic realm, which is along the bottom. But then there are some additional areas that one can define. There's the pelagic realm, that's open water, water that's deep enough that large organisms can swim in it. You have the continental shelf, which extends, depending on your um, continent, up to two miles offshore. And you have your intertidal zone. Generally, most of the continental shelf is within the photic zone, and so you have lots of organisms living on the bottom surface that can photosynthesize. Uh, the intertidal zone is the area between the high tide and the low tide, so organisms have to be able to deal with sometimes being submerged with salty water and other times being exposed to the air. Coral reefs are really special biomes. They are found in photic zones, so photosynthesis can occur and that can generate a lot of uh, nutrients for other organisms. Um, but they're found in warm waters that are tropical. So they're scattered around the globe. And these are extraordinarily important biomes because they often serve as the nurseries for many species of fish. And if the coral reefs are damaged, um, there will be decreases in populations of fish that um, as adults typically are found uh, in open water. So once again, the intertidal zone is where the ocean meets the land. Um, and as you can see in this picture of these starfish, they're currently being exposed to uh, the sun and drying winds. But uh, as the tide turns and the water uh, rises again, they will be submerged. An estuary is a transition between river and the ocean and at some times in the day, when the water is flowing down the river into the ocean, it's more fresh water. And then when the tide turns um, and the high tide is coming in, uh, the water will basically flow from the ocean up the river mouth and so the estuary will be salty. Because most of the estuaries um, are very shallow, they tend to all be in the photic zone, and that means you can have photosynthesis, and so you have high biological productivity that can support lots of organisms, including birds. So we should have a brief conversation about global climate change at this point, um, because it is relevant to organisms and biomes. As mentioned earlier, the distribution of different biomes is a result of annual temperature and precipitation. And global climate patterns are changing because of increases of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And as a result, this is changing the temperature and precipitation ranges found in uh, different areas and organisms are struggling to keep up with those changes. So what is the greenhouse effect? Well, there's a natural greenhouse effect that's important. Um, and what it is, there are greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, methane, and water that uh, are found in the atmosphere. And when solar radiation coming from the sun hits the Earth's surface, it bounces back up again. If there are many particles that are greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, it will reflect back some of that heat energy to the Earth's surface. And that actually raises the temperature of the Earth's atmosphere. If it wasn't for naturally occurring greenhouse gases, the Earth would actually be too cold for organisms to live on it. So a natural greenhouse effect is something that um, we desire. However, due to human activity, we've increased the amount of carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere. So we are 
experiencing an enhanced greenhouse effect. And this enhanced greenhouse effect is contributing to increases in global temperatures. The warming is greater over the land than the sea, partly because water has a high uh, specific heat. It takes a lot more energy to heat up water than it does land. And it's a greater warming over the northern hemisphere than the southern hemisphere, primarily because we have more land mass in the northern hemisphere than we do in the southern hemisphere. So this little picture here is a diagram illustrating some of the fluxes of carbon um, on the land and in the oceans. On the left hand side, what you see is there's a flux of carbon going from the atmosphere into plants via photosynthesis. So carbon dioxide is incorporated into plants, uh, into plant sugars. So carbon dioxide goes to glucose and then plants can then accumulate that in biomass. Some of that um, biomass will then enter soil carbon. Plants also respire or break down glucose and then they will release that carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. Microbes in the soil can decompose uh, carbon into carbon dioxide, releasing it back into the atmosphere. There's fossil carbon uh, from ancient fossilized organisms. Uh, the last period of intense fossilization was about 300 million years ago, I believe. Um, this was the Carboniferous. I'll have to check on my thousands versus millions here. Um, let's get back to the atmosphere. So we've got atmospheric CO2 and over the oceans you can have some amount of CO2 get dissolved into the water. So if you take CO2 plus water you make carbonic acid and that carbonic acid can then also uh, decompose into water and CO2 and releasing it. So there is some amount of photosynthesis in the photic zone and small amounts of um, carbon compounds can uh, descend into the aphotic zone where they may uh, enter the deep ocean or even uh, into uh, sediments. So what is the problem with human emissions? If you look at this little number here, it's nine. And I don't want to get into the units. Um, depending on your source, you can get slightly different numbers. Um, but I'm talking about the scale. That's the most important thing here. If humans are only um, emitting nine versus these very large numbers in the order of 10 times human emissions being exchanged by nature, what's the big deal? Well, it has to do with the input versus the output. Humans basically have increased the trickle of CO2 into the atmosphere, but it's being emitted about twice as fast as we remove it. So yes, we're increasing CO2 into the atmosphere, and sure, some of that CO2 is being absorbed by plants and soils, so 30% of that, 25% is absorbed by the oceans, but 45% of that actually remains in the atmosphere. And just like if you have your bathroom tap switched on and you've got more water coming into your bathtub then your drain can remove it, over time, your bath time will continue to fill. So, um, in 2008, it was 385 parts per million. And if I just quickly go on the internet, I'm going to go to amount of CO2 in the atmosphere right now. I can have a look at that data. It is currently CO2 now. Let's have a look at that. So I'm going on to NASA's site and 
it says that in 2013 the CO2 level surpassed 400 parts per million. So we're now over 400 parts per million. The highest recorded reading, which happened about 300,000 years ago, was 299. The levels before humans uh, started burning fossil fuels was at about 271. So we're really increasing the CO2 dramatically beyond natural levels. And um, the big debate is really what are the effects going to be on vegetation and uh, animals and their distribution? How is it going to be affecting uh, certain climate patterns such as hurricanes? Um, how is that going to be affecting human health and productivity? So now we can transition to something more fun, uh, at least for me. Uh, I really like ecology because I'm an ecologist and we're going to look at uh, community ecology, which is the interaction between organisms that live in the same space. So when you look at this picture, you might not see very much, but as an ecologist, there's a tremendous amount occurring. We have a predator, a lion, who is uh, down to prey, a zebra. The zebra was a herbivore who was eating the grass. There are many different species of grasses and plants that you can see in the foreground. We've got a scavenger, a hyena, and we also have some um, detritivores, which are the uh, vultures who are coming in to try to steal a little bit of the food from the lion. So there's a lot going on. And you can even go further and think about the ticks and the mites that are on the lion and the zebra and the parasites inside of their digestive systems and the bacteria that live in their anus, etc. Um, so we can get really carried away with this, but let's break it down into something simpler. So community ecology. An organism's biotic living environment includes the other individuals in its own population. So that's, if you're looking at the lion, it would be all of the other lions in that population. And then the populations of other species that live in the same area. So an assemblage of species that live close together are called a community. Now, there are different types of interactions that can happen between species, and they're classified according to the effect that they have. So if the interaction is an interaction that decreases the population of both of the interacting species, we'd call that a negative, negative interaction. That's a minus sign, minus sign. On the other hand, we can have interactions that benefit both populations, so we call those positive, positive. And then there are others that benefit one population and uh, negatively impact the other, such as in predation. It's definitely beneficial for the lion to eat the zebra, but not vice versa. Interspecific competition is when you have two species that compete for the same resource. So, for example, both zebra and wildebeest both eat grass and the, you could think that those two populations could negatively impact each other. In mutualisms, both species benefit from an interaction. A classic example is anemone fish and anemones. So the Nemo fish uh, gets protection from the sea anemone and when the Nemo fish um, defecates, the sea anemone gets the nutrients from that. On the right hand side you see a picture of some ants with some aphids. The ants are looking after the aphids and protecting them from predators and in return the aphids are producing something called honeydew uh, which is a nectar out of their anus for the ants to eat. Predation is when one organism kills and eats another and this is a very strong selective force um, because uh, if you are a prey item that is able to avoid being eaten, you will survive and live another day where you can breed and pass on your traits. If you're a predator who happens to have um, a particularly useful trait for catching prey, then you will survive and uh, proliferate.
So through predation, we have the adaptation of cryptic coloration or camouflage coloration and warning coloration. Uh, we've already talked about that earlier in the semester, uh, but the examples below, we have a toad who has cryptic coloration. Um, this is a dendrobates or arrow frog that has warning coloration to indicate that it's toxic. Um, we've got uh, in this bottom panel here pictures of two snakes. One of them is using warning coloration to accurately advertise that it is a toxic snake that will, um, sorry, a venomous snake that will uh, bite and hurt you. And the other is a mimic. It has evolved to resemble um, the toxic model or the venomous model um, and take advantage of looking like the model. Herbivory is related to predation, but it's the consumption of plant parts or algae by an animal. And plants, while you might think of them as being defenseless creatures that just stand there, over generations they have evolved numerous defenses against herbivory. So in the Arizona desert, you're very familiar with spines and thorns and prickles, um, but chemical toxins as well prevent organisms from eating plants. And as it turns out, a lot of the herbs and spices that you enjoy on your food, like peppermint, cloves and cinnamon, the chemicals that give those unique flavours are actually chemical toxins that can um, prevent a plant from being eaten by a herbivore. Um, parasites and pathogens um, can affect organisms. So a parasite is an animal that lives in or on a host, whereas pathogens are disease-causing. These are bacteria, viruses, fungi, and protists. The picture at the bottom is of a parasitoid fly. It's a tiny little fly that injects eggs at the back of an ant's head, um, and the larvae will eat the ant's brain, pupate, and then um, will close and be able to uh, start their life cycles over. Community ecologists use broad classifications to describe feeding relationships. We call this a trophic structure. At the bottom of your trophic structure, we have the producer level. These are organisms that are photosynthetic and convert carbon dioxide into sugar. The sugar and other compounds that are created by these producers are eaten by primary consumers, which are then eaten by secondary consumers, tertiary consumers, and so on and so forth. A terrestrial food chain typically starts with a plant. Then we have a herbivore, that means plant eater, herb, plant, vor, eater. A herbivore is eaten by a carnivore, and so on. We also have detritivores, these are called scavengers, and they consume dead material left by autrophic levels. So a vulture is a good example of a detritivore. On the other hand, we also have decomposers, and these tend to be microorganisms like prokaryotes and fungi, um, which can secrete enzymes to break up organic material into inorganic forms. When you consider uh, multiple food chains in the same area, one often finds that the food chains are linked together. So a food web is when you have multiple food chains that are linked, and they're often linked by important uh, organisms called omnivores. Omnivores eat organisms at multiple different trophic levels. In addition, it's rare to find an organism that is such a specialized feeder that it only eats one species of food. So for example, um, a grasshopper might have five or six different species of plant that it's happy to eat. Um, a hawk could be equally happy eating a chipmunk, a squirrel, or a snake. And so it's eating from multiple different levels in the food web. Ecosystem ecologists uh, look at both the community of species in an area 
and they also consider abiotic factors such as energy, soil, and water. So an ecosystem ecologist may be interested in tracing the pathway of, for example, carbon dioxide through an ecosystem. So from the air into a plant, into the soil, into another plant, into an organism that eats it, into the carnivore. Um, when it's defecated out, then it's broken down by microorganisms back into the soil, back into the air, and so forth. Uh, the earth could be considered to have energy flowing through the system. And we don't really have an energy problem on the planet. It's just a case of what kind of energy are we using. So each day, the earth gets the equivalent of about 100 million atomic bombs worth of solar energy. This would be sufficient to power most of um, the human needs in a single day for an entire year. Um, most of the energy is absorbed or scattered or reflected, and only about 1% is converted to chemical energy. The conversion of solar energy into chemical energy, it's called biomass, and we can calculate the rate at which an ecosystem does this, and we call that primary production. Different ecosystems vary in their primary productivity. So for example, the desert, because the, there are very few plants, it has very low primary productivity, so a low amount of conversion of sunlight energy into chemical energy. On the other hand, tropical rainforests and coral reefs have extremely high primary productivity because there's lots of moisture, lots of sunshine, and lots of organisms to convert that solar energy into chemical energy. When the energy flows um, through the trophic levels, much of it's lost at each link in the food chain. This caterpillar example is pretty telling. So for example, your caterpillar eats a plant. It eats 100 kilocalories or 100 calories of plant material. Most of the uh, chemical energy from that plant actually ends up getting defecated, so 50 kilocalories. About 35 kilocalories are used by the caterpillar for cellular respiration, basically to keep it alive and moving, and the remaining 15 kilocalories are used for the caterpillar to grow. So if a bird was to eat the caterpillar, it would only be getting the result of that 15 kilocalories. So the 100 kilocalories of plant converts only to 15 kilocalories of caterpillar. A pyramid of production illustrates that cumulative loss. Generally, the energy available at the next higher trophic level ranges from about 5 to 20 percent. So in this illustration, we use 10 percent as a nice uh, middling number. So if you had a, a 1 million calories of sunlight, that would convert to 10,000 calories of producer, 1,000 calories of primary consumer, 100 calories of secondary consumer, and 10 calories of tertiary consumer. As a result of this cumulative loss of energy, most ecosystems can only support four or five trophic levels. Chemicals, on the other hand, cycle. The Earth is a closed system with regards to um, atoms. So all the atoms that are on the Earth have been there and recycled. And it's uh, safe to say that you are made out of the same chemicals that might have passed through a dinosaur. Um, and life depends on that recycling of chemicals. So. The waste products are released by living organisms, decomposers will return molecules from an organism into the environment, and that pool of inorganic nutrients in the soil is used by plants and other producers to build new organic material.